morning. I'd like to welcome you all here this morning. I'd like to, you are all very welcome this morning, but I would like to do a special welcome to the D'Souza family. Um, <laughs> we've been blessed to see the children, but Pat, you are very welcome and very missed. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you too, but... <laughs> I'm going to open us in prayer. Father God, we just thank you. We thank you for this building that we can come to gather as your church. We just take a moment to pause and just allow the busyness of the morning to slip away and allow our focus to land on you. Open our hearts to what it is that you want to show us this morning. As we gather to praise and worship you, but also to, to learn from you this morning. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen. Um, we are just once again giving thanks that we are at full capacity. Uh, there are... There, no, you don't need to wear a mask, but you are welcome to wear a mask. It's whatever you are comfortable with at this point. Um, and also, there is no seating restrictions, so you can plunk yourself down wherever is comfortable. Um, and if you're still coming in and looking, there's lots in the front still. Um, I'm looking at my notes here because we do have a lot of announcements this morning um, for our, our young people, for youth. For all of April, May, and June, they are just meeting on Friday nights. Um, it actually kicks off at 4 o'clock, and from 4 to 6, there is a time of music and worship. Um, 6 p.m., there is a supper provided. There is a, a $5 cost to cover expenses, and you get a drink, a burger, and chips, I believe. So sounds like a sweet deal. Um, and then... If you really want to have supper at your own house, you are welcome to show up at 7, and from 7 to 9 is youth. So you can spend the whole time from 4 to 9, or you can come wherever you want to fit in for those. Um, <clears throat> moving on, there is a one-day uh, women's retreat. Nicole, can you just give a quick wave? April 30th, it's a Saturday across the street at the fountain. And if you need more details, Nicole will happily fill you in. Uh, we are also moving into the week of the, um, oh, I'm jumping ahead, sorry. We got the prayer early in the morning at the McCallum's with Pastor Bruce. Enough said. Um, and, and then we'll move into the next announcement, which is this is the week that they're going to start dropping off the uh, bags. And then on Good Friday is the collection. And um, there is a meeting following the service on all the details of that. So it is not too late to join in and be a part of this. Good Friday service here at 7 p.m. All are welcome. Bring a friend. Um, and then this Wednesday at 7 p.m., we are having our AGM. Uh, you can actually pick up the annual report. It's at the back. I'd like to give a special thank you to Brett, who has put in hours to get this all put together for you guys to, to read. Everyone is welcome to come to the AGM, and you're all welcome to ask questions. Uh, we just ask that voting is for those that are members. But anybody else can come and hear. You can pick up one of these reports and look through it beforehand, and you, you are welcome to bring questions if you have them. But uh, again, the voting will be just for members. And I believe that's all of our announcements. So we're going to invite the ladies up for singing this morning.
So this is an older song from Brit Alban that Mike Boulay wrote the words and music to. So some of you will remember it, and um, we're a little rusty, so if you know it, please sing.
is that great mystery of you are both victorious in your power and in your judgments over evil, but you're also, you're the lamb, you're the sacrifice lamb. And we realize, Lord, even on this communion Sunday that we'll end up there as we remember thinking about your great sacrifice for us. So as we go through this service, Lord, bring it back to us that you died for us to set us free. Thank you, Jesus. You are worthy. Amen. Isaiah 43, verse 19 says this, I am doing a new thing. It is springing up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. I love that verse. <laughs> it is the beginning of spring. It is Communion Sunday. There are about 
14 of us who were on a retreat this weekend and God began to work. And hopefully that is your story too, that God is at work. He's nudging, he's moving, he has something new for you. But you need to pay attention because it can also just pass you by. It can pass by. What is the thing God is trying to do in you and will you let him? Can you see it spring up? I pray that you will take time to not rush through the day, through the service, through the work God is doing, and pay attention. Pay attention to what he's doing. And then respond. And then respond. So that is our, our call to worship. None of us need to gather here unless we can say worthy is the Lamb. We are a people who belong to Jesus. We are a people who belong to Jesus. We will celebrate what he has done, what he is doing, and what he will yet do in us through his church. Let me pray for us. May your hearts be soft to hear from the Lord Jesus this morning. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the only true God, we come to you, we sing to you, we gather because of you, we enjoy fellowship, we learn about what it means to love one another, forgive one another, carry one another's burdens, weep with those who weep, laugh with those who laugh. We do that together as a family. And Lord, it is because of you that we can strengthen bonds that call us to a central place, the bullseye of Jesus Christ. Thank you for bringing these people, this family, us, together this day. We praise you and thank you in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm just going to transition briefly before I give this back to Cheryl, and that is to let you know um, that Carol and Zarina, Zakhar and Herman are still in Ukraine. Uh, they have received a doctor's note. They are hoping to get out tomorrow the day after, and they are in process. Our first Ukrainian of the 18 we're trying to bring over got here on Friday night and they are settling in the Kempville area and so I just need to say to let you know Susan, Susan and I worked together last Monday, Tuesday for ad nauseum hours but this would not go forward without Susan. She has been so dedicated to filling out forms as we talk back and forth with um, Kirill. And uh, Susan came on to the leadership team as the treasurer a couple of years ago, a, year, a little bit more, right? A year and a half ago? Anyhow, um, she is a real team player for this church and we're very thankful because she just took this on and she is working really hard on behalf of the Plato family. Thank you. So we will um, take prayer requests now, and that will be our first, is just that that paperwork, that nothing holds that up. So if there's any other prayer requests, Yvonne, praise him. Amen. So just in case anybody in the back didn't hear that, Yvonne's friend Pierre, who we've been praying for, is, is recovering and doing well. And knows that we've been praying, so that's a good thing. Praise God. 
So Vivica last week had a, a prayer request, and she's saying that this week things are doing, it's been, a, it's been a much better week. So we will just continue to pray for you, Vivica, that just keeps getting better and better. Yes, Zoe. Sure. Zoe has asked us to pray for those around the world that are homeless. Jennifer? Okay, we're going to continue to pray for Cade, who's just been struggling with a lot of things, and, and for his parents, who um, are kind of heartbroken with that. Bruce? The whole country. You mean? No. Okay, so Bruce has asked us to remember to continue to pray for Neil, Ron, and Selene. And also, just, just the country of Ukraine. Yes. Okay, and was that Laura? Lawrence, okay. So, praying for Lawrence, whose work keeps him from coming to church, and his sister Heather, who's, who her, needs to be saved. Yes, okay. And we'll, we'll pray for the Red Ribbon campaign, just that that is well received, but Sure. Sue. All right. So um, the last two were about giving thanks that through her, her work and interior works, her, her eyeglasses have been completely covered and faith fans almost all. And we're going to lift up Faith Ann because she has dental surgery tomorrow. And Sue has asked us to pray for the peace negotiations in Turkey. So we're going to just head right into a time of prayer. Father, we just thank you that there is so much here to give thanks for. Um, we thank you for Yvonne's friend Pierre and the healing that's happening there. Um, Lord, we, we thank you for Lawrence who has this heart to be at church. We pray for encouragement and maybe even things to change in his work environment so that he can come. And we thank you, Lord, that his, his, his heart is to see his sister come to know you. So we lift up Heather to you, and we ask, Father, that you would put people in place uh, to help um, to plant those seeds, Lord, to, to just share you with her. Thank you for Vivica and that she's had a good week, Lord, and... We just pray that you continue to work in her life, Lord, and just continue to surprise her with your goodness, we pray. We thank you for Zoe, Lord, and her heart for the homeless. We pray for those all across the world, Lord, that are without a home. We pray, Lord, that, that as you are our covering, that you would provide a physical covering. We lift up the Plato family to you, and we just pray that this paperwork would be complete. We pray for the paperwork that Sue is working on as well, and just that these things would all come together and quickly, and we pray for good news that they have left the country. We thank you for Jennifer and her friends um, at West, and we just lift up Kate to you, Lord, and we pray, Lord, for, for you to be at work in his life. Draw him to you, Lord. 
uh, he knows about you, God. So we pray that, that you would draw him to you and comfort his parents at this time. Give them wisdom on how to parent a, a grown child. We thank you for, for Neil, Ron, and Celine, and we just pray, Lord, that you would continue to bring healing and improvement to health. We lift up the Ukraine and all that is going on there, Lord. We pray for peace. We pray for the peace talks in Turkey. But we pray for peace in Ukraine and in Russia. And Lord, there, there's, this is the, the world that's getting the news coverage, but there is war in Africa. There is war in other places in this world. And so, Lord, we think of all those that are dealing with war. And we pray for your presence to be there. Father, I thank you for your provision for Brett. We would lift up Faith Ann, and we pray uh, just for peace and comfort for her and for a quick recovery. All these things we lay before you. Ah, yes, and Lord, the Red Ribbon Campaign, I don't want to forget that. Lord, I pray that this would be so well received in our community. We pray um, not just for, for generosity in the giving, but just even just some conversations, Lord, that would, would happen because of it, and that the people would, would hear a little bit more about you, and maybe even think about asking some questions and getting to know you. Lord, we pray for our community and, and for, for opportunities to happen, Lord, where Jesus' experiences happen, and people have to go investigating who this Jesus is. And, and let us, Lord, be a place that, that is always ready to give an answer for who you are and what you have done in our own lives. We lift up Pastor Bruce to you, and we thank you, Lord, that week after week he comes faithfully with a message from you. And we just pray, Lord, that all of our hearts would be open to receive the message that you have already laid on his heart this week. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen. almost forgot all of our young ones can head off to Children's Church. Thank you so much for being patient through that prayer time. And Cheryl, just before you go, Cheryl was the winner of the earliest Robin. She, yeah. No, you weren't the earliest. I sh you were the first one to send me a photo. You got to send me photo proof, folks. And um, it's too bad there was nobody under 18 that sent me one. I guess kids just don't have phones. Yeah. Oh, well. There's always next year. Yeah. Because I usually give out two prizes. Uh, so, we are back to our Thessalonians series. As, um, as a student of the Bible, if you consider yourself a student of the Bible, and uh, if you don't, you should consider yourself becoming a student of the Bible. Because it is God's revealed word to us. And there's nothing better you can invest your time in than in the Bible. And there's a few ways to become a student. There's a few ways to approach the Bible, I should say. Um, there's what I call the, uh, the volume approach. And that is, you can just listen to it. You can play it. You could be doing some menial task like washing dishes or for me when I work in my shop. I often just put it on and I play it. I don't hear it all, but I listen to volumes of it. And then there's a more intensive approach or, or a thematic approach where you might say you want to ask the Bible questions like, what does it say about sexual purity? What does it say about gender issues? And so you start to search up a number of passages. 
Or you want to do an intensive study where you kind of drill down on, on smaller pieces. And that's what we're doing in the Thessalonian series. We go slow, we take little chunks, and we think about it, and we look at it. And so that's, there's these different ways to approach the Bible. So we're doing this, more intensive, but you need to do some of those others on your own because you won't just get enough by coming Sunday morning and getting uh, 20 minutes worth. Or Okay, well, it's, when is it ever 20 minutes, eh? When does he ever just preach 20 minutes? Never. Okay, so <clears throat> anyhow. Uh, so to bring you up to speed, we took a two-week break. And um, this is Paul's second missionary journey. So here's this guy commissioned by God. He's going around to cities and towns that know nothing about Jesus. And he's introducing them. He goes and he preaches and he talks about, you know, there's this Messiah has come. And how do we know it's Messiah? Because he's been risen from the dead. And he, and he makes studies on it. And he, he preaches to them. Well, on one particular trip, on his second trip, he ends up in what we would call today kind of northern Greece or that Macedonia area. And he's, he goes into one town and he gets run out of town. And then he goes to Thessalonica and he's only there three Sundays and he gets run out again. He goes to the next town, Berea, and he gets chased out of there as well. He ends up down in, at the southern tip of Greece, down by Athens, and, 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 he, and then he goes to Corinth and he settles in there for a few years. And while he's there, the guy that he was going around with, Timothy, he goes back to Thessalonica and he meets with the church there because they're so young. They only had three Sundays of Paul's preaching, three Saturdays. And, and, and so he talks to them and he brings questions back to Paul and Paul in turn writes two letters. And it's those two letters that we have in our Bible, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Okay, and so we're doing that intensive study, and we're in 1st Thessalonians. Uh, last time we talked about Paul, in chapter 4, Paul was answering that question. One of the questions that they sent with Timothy was, what happens to people when they die? Will they miss out on the rapture? Will they miss out on the Lord coming back? Because they've already died. And of course he says, no, no, they're not going to miss out. They're not going to be disadvantaged in any way. They actually have a bit of an advantage. They, they come with Jesus and they get reunified with their bodies and they meet with Jesus in the air. They go ahead of those who are actually living at the time when Jesus returns. And he tells this mystery about that event. And so no, they're not disadvantaged. And so he, that was a big question for them. But now he, they've got another question. And so we pick it up in chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm going to read 11 verses. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there's peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, 
but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. May the Lord add his blessing to this, the reading of his word. So he's dealt with that question of what happens to the dead. And now they're asking, okay, but when does all this happen? When does this happen? What's the timing? They want to know, like, okay, you've told us Jesus is coming back, but when is, it com when is he coming back? And so he's answering this question. Now concerning times and seasons. And some people want to separate this into two events, but no, he's talking about the return of Jesus. As he, just a few sentences ago, this is what he said. This we declare you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord. That's the subject matter. That's what he's talking about. He hasn't uh, shifted here. And he says, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. For Paul, the Lord's return, the return of the Lord Jesus, the second coming of Jesus, is synonymous with the day of the Lord. As I said, some people try to separate this into two comings to kind of support own personal or perspectives on the end times that they've come up with. But, you know, you wouldn't write a letter to a friend talking about your vacation. You know, I'm, I'm going to be taking this holiday, and you're writing, you're talking about your vacation. And then, you, and then in the next paragraph, you say, yeah, we're planning to go this summer. Well, when you're talking about the timing, you're talking about that vacation that you just brought up. You didn't, you're not talking about the timing about some other completely different event. You're talking about the timing of that vacation. And, and it's the same thing here. He doesn't shift gears. He's talking about the return of Jesus. So they ask when. They ask when. When's this going to happen? And Paul doesn't answer when. He doesn't answer the timing issue because he doesn't know. He's standing on good ground there because that's exactly what Jesus did. Right? We talked about this when we brought up the rapture, when we were talking about the rapture two weeks ago, that in that scene in Matthew 24, you know, Jesus come out of the temple and the disciples get all excited and they want to show off this big, beautiful building to Jesus, and they, and they point to the architecture, and they point to the massive stones. And don't forget, Jesus knows everything that's coming. And he knows that in about 40 years, there's this Roman general called Titus, who's going to lead a group of Roman soldiers, and they're going to utterly destroy Jerusalem. And they're going to pull down all those beautiful big stones. And so that's what he says. He doesn't say, oh yeah, well, do you know in 40 years Titus is coming? No, he doesn't say that. He says, you see these stones? I tell you, every one of them will be pulled down. And they get all excited and they're like, and they go to him privately and they say, tell us, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your return? They ask when. And he doesn't answer. He doesn't tell them when. He tells them, don't get taken in by false reports. Don't get disturbed by events that you hear about. And whatever you do, don't get called, suckered into any talk about the Messiah 
secretly being somewhere, having come, that he's out in the desert, that he's out in the wilderness. Don't go chasing after these rumors, is what he says. And then he says, therefore, stay awake, for you do not know the hour or the day that your Lord is coming. And he confesses to them, he doesn't know, the angels don't know, nobody knows except the Father himself. So, Paul continues and says, while people are saying there is peace and security, then suddenly destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Uh, I remember being in the basement, hearing a noise, and then hearing, Bruce! <laughs> and Alicia was on the way. And it came suddenly, and we panicked. And we got all packed up, and we ran to the car. So he says, while people are saying peace and security, and you've probably heard, as I have, a lot of end time preachers make uh, get a, they, they make a lot of hay out of this saying. A lot of you know they, they draw specific analogies to modern events or to what's going on with Israel, and and they want to talk and 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 that draws crowds and and they can write books and they get on Christian TV and so on because of these things. But Paul's probably talking about the Roman propaganda, the government propaganda of the day. Because that was part, just like, you know, we see Russia move into the Ukraine, you know, the big military power. Well, the big military power of that day was the Romans and the Roman army. And their propaganda machine was, we bring you peace and security. It's a gift to you to every people that they conquered. They said, we're bringing you salvation. We're bringing you peace and security. And Paul's kind of mocking that. Paul's mocking that, saying, you know, you hear the Romans saying this, peace and security. He says, but don't buy into it. The only peace and security truly will come from the Lord. And he kind of mocks this as being dangerous. But note the surprise factor. The surprise factor. It'll come on people like labor pains. Come on a pregnant woman. But the surprise factor is not for everyone. You don't, not everyone will be overwhelmed by Jesus' coming. He says, but you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. Christians will not be overwhelmed by that day. We will rejoice in that day. Because that is the day. It will lift up your heads. Your salvation is near. The Lord has come. And so Paul wants to draw, in, and he's going to draw a very sharp distinction between believers and unbelievers. And watch how he does that. He's going to set up these two groups. And he's going to use this type of language. When he talks about the believers, he's going to talk about your part of the day, your part of light. You're the ones that are awake. You're the ones that are sober. When he talks about the unbelievers, he associates them with the night, with darkness, that they're asleep, and it's as though they're in a drunken stupor. Okay? So here's how he says it. For you are children of the light. He's just said that day doesn't have to surprise you because you're children of the light. And light is about truth. You're children of the light. You know the truth. You're children of the day. We're not of the night. See, is the, the difference. Or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do. But let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. And so the concept is simple. 
the coming of the Lord Jesus will catch unbelievers off guard. That's what he's saying. He's saying it's as though they're asleep at the switch. It's as though they're going around in a drunken stupor. They're in a fog. And they're, and they're totally clueless when it comes to God. And it says it'll totally catch them off guard. But we belong to the day. Now as is his pattern, he's going to take a truth of the gospel and he's going to, and he's going to present it and then he's going to go, therefore, live this way. Because you know this is true, therefore, live this way. So he says, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith. And here's the triad, faith, love, and hope. The importance of faith, the importance of love, and the, and the importance of the hope of salvation that we have. He said unbelievers are going to be totally surprised. They're going to be overwhelmed. It'll be a day of destruction. But for not for believers. Look what he says. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. Romans 8.1 There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Those things you feel guilty about, we all feel guilty about some things we've done in our past. Those things you feel guilty about, there's no condemnation coming from God because of those things. Jesus has borne it on the cross. He died for us. That's why it won't be a day of wrath. It won't be a day of judgment. It won't be a day of, 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 of the fear of all that guilt. Is it going to manifest itself in some type of judgment from our God and Creator? No. Because you've put your faith in Jesus Christ who died for your sin. That's what he's telling them. He's saying there's two groups. Yeah, the day of the Lord's going to come and, and it's going to be horrible for some and it's going to be magnificent for others. That's what he's saying. So, whether we are awake or asleep, and now here he's referring back to his first question, right? Those who have died. And so he's summing it up. When Jesus comes, it doesn't matter if, you, if you've died previously or you're awake when, you, when he comes. You're going to live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up. And, and Paul's quick to encourage them, you know, just as you're doing, just as you're doing. Good job, good job, he's saying. And you know, let me just take a moment just to encourage you. I know it was the members that voted, but you support this church, you're part of this church. I am so proud to be able to be the pastor to say, you know what, we're bringing a family from the Ukraine. Our people got behind it, and we voted for it. And we said, we committed that one year that we're going to support them. You know? Good job. Well done. Be proud of the fact that you're part of a group that's doing that. So, what should we take from this? What should we take from this? Well, the first thing we should take is recognize the temptation that they fell into, just like the disciples fell into, because it's human nature. We all want to know, when's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? That's just normal. That's just normal. You're not wrong. You're not bad for wanting to know that. We all want to know. If I could know, oh man, I'd love to know. But for whatever reason, we have to trust God has his reasons. He's cloaked it. And said, I'm not telling you. I'm not telling you. And I speculate about that. And I go, yeah, if I knew, 
Maybe I put my feet up until the old, until that, or, or you know, I'd know. Well, okay, he's not coming in my lifetime, so I should live to be this amount of time, and so I, I can take it easy. You know, I I don't know what his rationale is. All I know is that he's he said, "I'm not telling you." And like all temptations. If we get too focused on the timing, it becomes a distraction. And a, a distraction from what's truly important. Like Paul here, they ask about the timing. And, and he shifts the, his answer to make sure that you put on faith, love, and hope. Make sure you keep encouraging each other. Make sure you know that you're going to be part of the group that doesn't receive wrath. He doesn't at all get caught up in the timing. So why does Paul talk about the sudden destruction? You know, that's kind of negative, isn't it, Paul? Oh, you're a war lover, you, you know, you like, what's with this? coming? All this sudden destruction coming upon the unbelievers. Well, in order to answer this question, you have to understand what he means by the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, it's got a strong biblical background. It comes out of the Old Testament. It's a concept. I'll show you in a moment how that built. But it, it gets associated with judgment. It gets associated with the end, with final judgment, with Armageddon, with all those, all those themes. It's a day of judgment. Day of judgment. This is how kind of it, it, it began. It began as an understanding of the day of judgment against the enemies of God and salvation or rescue for his own people. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. Peter picks up that theme. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar. It's an indication of God's judgment. It's coming suddenly and it's coming upon the earth. But in terms of the actual understanding, what does he mean by the day of the Lord? What, what is that? Because there's, there's quite a package that comes with that. And I won't get to all of it, but let me give you a, a little idea so you have an understanding. We know that at the heart of sin is rebellion. Right? We can go back to the garden. We see Adam and Eve. Uh, they wanted to be able to decide for themselves what is good, what is evil. They wanted to usurp God's authority. And ever since, human beings have tried to put themselves in the place of God. We want, we want to be the judges of what's good and evil, what's right and wrong. We don't want to necessarily listen to your standards. That's rebellion. That's rebellion. Our creator has said, here's what's right and wrong. And we go, no, 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 let us figure it out. It's rebellion against God. And, and all structures, human structures of rebellion, represent that, that, that opposition to God's authority. So a classic example of that is Egypt. Okay? Remember the scene in Egypt? The, they're enslaved by the Egyptians. And the Egyptians are the epitome of evil. Pharaoh gets intimidated by the numbers of people that are growing in these Israelites. So he says, let's start killing the boys. Because we don't want them to rebel against us. No, this, is, this is evil through and through. Okay? And then God comes in a day and rescues his people. Do you remember, so you know about the plagues and, and, and the plagues. Each one of those plagues, you should go in and study that. Every one of them was God showing himself as being more powerful than one of the gods of Egypt. Because every one of those plagues represented a god of Egypt that they worshipped. And Jehovah showed himself more powerful. He judged his enemies. And then, what were, but what was the final act where the people were finally free and Pharaoh was no longer in the picture? 
What was the final act? Do you remember? The Red Sea. Yeah. Yeah. The Red Sea. Where he, just like, you know, you're not going to suffer wrath. The seas part. The people go through. They try to go through. And God brings judgment on his enemies. And the evil is swallowed up. Okay? There was also a significant event in Egypt where the people were rescued from the destroying angel who came and killed all the firstborn. What was it that they put on the door frames to protect themselves so that the destroying angel went over? Vivica? The blood of the lamb. Pretty hard to miss the significance of that, right? The blood of the lamb. The people of God are saved by the blood of the lamb in Egypt. Fast forward to Calvary, the people of God are saved by the blood of the Lamb. We see Jesus victorious over his enemies. Okay, so somebody brought up that the Red Sea was the final event. It says in Exodus, after they got to the far shore, it says this, Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. Ever since that time, they st every year God instituted right into his word a celebration to remember his rescuing. What was the name of that celebration? Passover. Yeah. When the angel passed over them because of the blood of the lamb. But it's a package. They celebrate the rescue from Egypt. And, and then, every time the Israelites got threatened, whether it was from the Philistines, the Syrians, the Moabites, the Assyrians, the Babylonians. It didn't matter. Whoever came against them, they waited for a day of the Lord. A day of the Lord when, when God would come and vindicate his people and judge them, judge their enemies and destroy the enemies. That was the day of the Lord. And they would pray for this day of the Lord to come against their enemies. Okay? So now you... That was going... That was kind of the way the day, the day of the Lord developed. It's like Habakkuk, he says, when the Babylonians are coming, he says, I will wait quietly for the day of trouble to come on the people who invade us. That was a day of the Lord like prayer. But then this... You know who the shepherd prophet prophet is in the Old Testament, the shepherd prophet. God called a shepherd to come and preach. His name is Amos. Very good. Very good. And he comes and he gives day of the Lord like pronouncements. He pronounces against the Damascus. He pronounces against Tyre. He pronounces against the Philistines. All, all these enemies of Israel. And you, so you can just hear them all going, that's good. That's good. God's going to judge our enemies. And then it shifts. And he says, and God's going to judge Israel. And you could just feel the shock wave go through. No, 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 no. The day of the Lord is about you judging our enemies. But he pronounces a judgment against the north, against Israel, and he pronounces a judgment against the south, against Judah and Jerusalem. And that came to pass in the year 586 when the Babylonians came and they tore down Jerusalem and they tore down the first temple. And that was a day of the Lord, but it was against God's own people. And suddenly... The idea of the day of the Lord wasn't just God's going to defeat the enemies of Israel, but that God's going to defeat evil. And if his people fall into evil, he will defeat them. God will defeat evil, and he'll still rescue his people. And so this is how the day of the Lord came to be, and so that when Paul says to the Thessalonians, that day of the Lord 
when God comes to judge evil, it will overwhelm the pagans. It will overwhelm the unbelievers. It will truly be shock and awe when Jesus returns. So, application then, if you're here, or if you're listening at home, somebody sent you this video, for whatever reason, you just don't buy in. You just don't believe this. You come to church because somebody drags you here or something. Or you listen because you're trying to be polite. Your wife wants you to listen. And, uh, but you've just never put your faith in Jesus Christ. I don't know what your reason is. Maybe you think it's a fairy tale. Maybe you think there's just too much evidence to speak that God's not real. I used to be there. First 20 some years of my life, that's what I believed. But I just want to tell you, what the Bible tells you is that there is a day coming. Now, the reality is most likely it'll be your death. But there is a day coming where after that point, after you die, you're going to be judged by God. We sang that song, Every Knee Will Bow. Every Knee Will Bow. That, that there's a passage in the scriptures that talks that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, we sing it, we praise it and stuff, and, and, and we get excited about it, and we're not destined for wrath. It will be a tremendous day. We'll be excited to see the Lord. Whether that's through our death and we go to see the Lord, or whether we're part of that one small tiny part of human population that is alive at the time when the Lord returns, we'll get to see the Lord. Either way, dead or alive, we get to see the Lord. We'll be excited about it. But don't miss the point either. It will be a day of judgment and a day of horror for those who have not come to faith in Jesus Christ. That is what the Bible teaches. You might not like that truth. You might be uncomfortable with it. But don't hide yourself from what it actually says. Because it does say, the day of the Lord will come. And everybody understood what the day of the Lord was. It was a day of judgment. And ultimately it will be a day when God totally eradicates evil. So, I'll leave that for you to think about. It is a day of warning. It is a day of warning for unbelievers. And it's a day of reassurance for believers. You'll be with the Lord. But meanwhile, we're told, stay ready. Stay ready. Because he describes his coming as that like a thief in the night. Uh, Jesus himself says that. Notice the final line there. Therefore you must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Gets repeated again in the Revelation. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that on that day, you not go about naked and be seen exposed. That is your sins exposed on that day. So what does it mean then to stay ready? What does it mean to stay ready? I think you could boil it down to one word. For me it's the most important word. Faithfulness. Faithfulness. You stay faithful. I don't know what's all going on in your life. We were, Bergen and I had a conversation this week with a friend. Uh, she's been 
battling cancer for 10 years and she just got more bad news and looks like she's got a tougher fight coming. She knows she needs a miracle. We're praying for her because that's what God asks us to do. We pray. We pray in hope. We pray in faith. And we pray for her faith that she will remain faithful. Regardless of what happens, you remain faithful. I can't picture being in the Ukraine. You see some of those pictures from some of the bombed out cities. You picture being in, in, in some shelter, in a bomb shelter, in a, what was it, a, a theater? And they bombed the theater. And you're trapped inside. And, and hundreds die. Regardless of what your situation is, failing health, broken relationships, regardless of what's happening, you stay faithful. There's no simpler way to go, how should I be ready? How should I be ready for the Lord? No, don't focus on the timing. Focus on your own character and being faithful. Being faithful to the Lord. It'll require sacrifice, it'll require time, it'll require effort, but you remain faithful. You know, it's, it, it, it's not going to come out in one big event where you get to show you that you're faithful. Chances are, you'll never have anybody point a gun at your head and say, deny Jesus or I'm going to shoot you. Eh, that ain't going to happen, realistically. But day in and day out, the choices you make, the decisions that you make every day, every moment, every conversation, that's what defines faithfulness. Not the big moment. So be faithful in the little things. Be faithful day in and day out. You want to be ready? I don't think there's any more practical way to be ready for the Lord's return and to remain faithful in all that you do. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. not just me. <laughs> See, it's not just me that can't open them. Thank you, honey. Do you have a preference of what you want to pray for? Do you have a preference of what you want to pray for? You know, as I think about the, the church from a historical perspective, the first time Jesus gathered his disciples to do this, he told them, he set it down as a standard, and, and he said, do this in remembrance of me. You know, set it up as a pattern. And ever since then, the church has been doing that. They gather at regular times all around this globe, to remember the central act of the Christian church, the death of Jesus. The time he died for our sins. It's why we can look forward to his return, because we will not suffer wrath 
under the day of the Lord. Because Jesus died for us. And so we can, in that continuum of the church, we stand with Christians who for 2,000 years have been repeating this as we wait for the Lord. Most of those Christians faithfully just went to their deaths. That may be our good chance. It'll be you and me as well. That we just faithfully live throughout our life. But if we happen to be alive when the Lord returns, we have nothing to be afraid of and everything to be excited about. I'll ask our brother Mark to give thanks for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we gather as your people in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and Holy Spirit, we, as your people, unite in the love that we have for you, and we desire to show this in our faithfulness to you this day by obeying what you've commanded us to do this in remembrance of you. So Jesus, as we pause and we take this time to reflect on our sinfulness and the gift of eternal life that you've given to us in your death, we do remember Jesus. We remember that this bread that we're about to take symbolizes your body and how you were beaten and bruised how you were whipped with pieces of bone and metal. How your hands were cruelly pierced to the cross and your feet nailed with the force of our sin. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for loving us so much. Jesus, thank you for taking that crown of thorns upon your head. Thank you for taking that beating, that punishment that was due to each and every one of us. We do remember Jesus, and we do give thanks. In your holy name we pray. Amen. 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 And you're, you're going to... Uh, in a moment, take the bread and the cup. I'm going to pray for the cup, but before I do, just remember. It's not that you're a nice person that's going to get you into heaven. This is what's going to get you into heaven. Not, not the physical elements, but what it represents. That you put your faith in the fact that Jesus dies for you. He is his physical body for you. And he sheds his physical blood for you. Okay. Jesus, thank you. As Mark prayed for her, that you gave your body. And I thank you that you gave your real blood. Blood was such a part of that Old Testament sacrificial system. They knew about the blood of the Lamb. And now here you are, the sacrificial lamb, the darling of heaven, the son. Father, thank you that you did not spare your son. Jesus, thank you that you were willing to die on our behalf and shed your blood. We will look forward to celebrating with you. We will look forward to what you've planned for us in all of eternity, in your kingdom. Meanwhile, Lord, help us to be faithful to you. Help us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. The bread is a symbol of the Lord's body. Take and eat. The cup is the symbol of the Lord's blood, the blood of the Lamb that was shed for you. Take and drink. Thank you, Jesus, 
Thank you for what you've done for us. And I pray, Father, that you'd keep us faithful. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand together. Just a reminder to the, uh, anyone involved in the Red Ribbon or anyone who wants to be, there's a meeting right afterwards. You represent Jesus Christ. So wherever you go, whatever you do, you've been spared by the blood of the Lamb. You have the kingdom coming for you. Take that knowledge, go forth, and live well, and represent him well. Amen.